from Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 195, recorded on May 26th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommiers. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. Um, Looking out my window, and I've had it open, but I shut it because we have our air conditioner on. It's a little warmish out there today, a little hazy out there today, Um, and very atypical for this time of the year, but uh, welcome weather, considering what it was like last week. So I'll take it. Also joining us from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. And from Glasgow, Scotland, Christina Naula. Hello, everybody. And um, if I'm looking out of my window, it's grey, and it has been about 17 degrees centigrade, <laughs> which I think is about 62 Fahrenheit. So not wow. too bad for um, Glasgow summer. Glasgow summer, huh? So would the Scottish people characterize the weather as burr? I'm not sure because I'm not native. <laughs> That's right. You're not from Scotland, Sorry. right? No. Where are you from? I thought that was some kind of you know sophisticated Scots word that I didn't know, but yeah. I see now. I There's a lot of burrs on your words. I'm a bit slow today. Christina, remind no, me. I'm slower. Trust me. Where are you? Are you from England? Switzerland. Switzerland. Grew up in Switzerland. I'm Swiss and Italian, so. Ah. Can't you tell by the accent? No. <laughs> I think you've acclimated. Uh, yeah. Yes. For sure. All right. This is TWIP. That means we have a case. Daniel, remind me what we have. Remind us. We, we do. do. We so do. let me remind everyone tuning back in. And for those of you tuning in for the first time, um, on the last episode, we close with a mystery case of a woman in her 40s. Um, She's actually, she, she's native here to Long Island, I'll say, patient of mine. And uh, she has started to go to Puerto Rico. She actually has a place in Puerto Rico. She goes there quite often. Um, she's gotten to know a lot of uh, people down there. And uh, she, she comes to me because she went down to um, Puerto Rico one time. And she goes to the local beaches, right? She, she knows a lot of people down there. And she's down on the local beach. She's walking around barefoot. Um, you know, people bring their dogs and uh, she, she gets the connection. She, she offers this history up to me. Um, but the reason she's coming to see me is she noticed some issue on her foot. Um, and uh, we've got great, I have great pictures. She has great pictures. Um, I always enjoy when my patients <laughs> take photos. It's photo documented, but there are these raised red serpiginous lines on her on her foot and she actually takes several pictures so it's almost like a time lapse you can see that these lines seem to be slowly moving all over the foot um, and she actually has blood work that showed elevated eosinophils that may have been one of the shortest descriptions <laughs> ever <laughs> This is and true anything more than that he would have given it away <laughs> nevertheless we do have guesses uh, Christina, could you take that first one? Sorry, done the mute thing. <laughs> Anthony writes, oh no, it's hookworms, grab the ivermectin <laughs> quick. Regarding the last case about the eye amoeba, I had forgot to share the paper pointing to the finger at Valcampia, and he gives a link to that. Anthony. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. All right, Dixon, can you take the next one? Yes, I can. Alexander writes, Dear Twipsters, the woman who returned from Puerto Rico probably suffers from an early stage infection with hookworm, most commonly either A. duodenal or N. americanus. This geohelminth is transmitted via soil when the L3 larvae come in contact with the skin and manage to penetrate it. This leads to intense itching and these serpiginous lines. Last, late stages of the infection can cause Uh, gastrointestinal problems and anemia, which can uh, be severe and sometimes requires transfusions. Prevention is achieved by wearing closed shoes in areas where hookworm are endemic, building toilets with adequate plumbing, or at least latrines with a depth of over six feet, and deworming programs. The therapeutic agent of choice is albendazole. 
Interesting fact, the complex cycle of infection for this group of parasites was discovered at the Goddard Tunnel construction site in Switzerland during the late 19th century. An epidemic of diarrheal disease and anemia was linked to the workers defecating in the tunnel and walking about in worn-out shoes with holes in them. All the best and take care, Alexander, from Vienna, Austria. Christina, do you know this Gotthard Tunnel? I do, yes, and I've been through it, although not through this particular one because there's been a newer, longer one built since. And I hope you had good shoes when you went through it. I had good shoes, yeah, it was 17 kilometers, so (laughs) we went through it by car. Right. But I do know the story well from a really great lecturer here in Glasgow. So so do you know the name of the doctor that did the examination on the patients? No, I don't remember. I'm sorry. Dr. Dubini. Oh. Dubini. Dr. Dubini. Daniel. I don't remember that. Daniel, you're I next. do believe he's one of the heroes featured in our textbook. Indeed he is. Yeah. Daniel, you're next. Um, Adil writes? No, um, Kevin. No, no, Kevin. 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 This is a different Kevin because it's very it's short. Apparently so. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. This is a, this is a I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do two. Dear magnanimous doctors, my case guess for TWIP-194 is cutaneous larva migrants caused by Ancylostoma brasiliensa. I have doubts because many sites describing soil transmitted helmets do not mention A. brasiliensis, but perhaps this is simply an oversight on their part. Warm <laughs> regards, Kevin. And Adil writes, elevated eosinophils, Puerto Rico, and lower extremity lesions make me think hookworm. You mentioned beach walks and someone also asking about dogs in passing. You said it's an easy case, so I'm confident enough by the <laughs> time of reading this may count as my first guess as an MD, Adele. Uh, I'm getting worried about the the other Kevin wow. now because this is like the second or third time we don't have a guess from him. Yeah. Oh, no. He may have given up on us. I don't, I don't think, think so. so. I don't, I don't think, think so. <laughs> I'm worried. No, he doesn't give up. I'm very worried. <laughs> All right. Joe writes, Uh-oh. It's in the mid-60s with low humidity, sunny with little wind in Seattle as I write this. After years of enjoying twit from, the, from its onset, listening to periodic descriptions of various and sometimes shocking diseases described in attractive New York accents... <laughs> I am finally moved to enter my prognosis <laughs> to the disease described in TWIP 194, the lady who visits the sandy beaches in Puerto Rico who developed itchy red patches on her feet. My prognosis is not based on education and training, but on personal experience, quote, the kind that makes you sick. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I was raised in New York City during the 1940s to early 1950s. At that time, a scourge attacked New Yorkers, particularly school-aged children. The rapidly spreading disease affected mostly the scalp of children, including myself, causing patches of baldness and red markings. The outbreak of an unknown disease alarmed parents, teachers, and New York doctors who did not know what was causing the ugly patches on children. Apparently, at that time, tropical skin diseases were not part of standard training for New York physicians. While the cause of our disease was unknown by New York doctors, many affected children were treated by applying a variety of common substances, such as vinegar, dilute Clorox baths, talcum powder, and the like. I still remember my parents shaving my head to baldness and trying ultraviolet treatment by placing a purple light bulb on my head for hours. But nothing seemed to work. That is until it was discovered by a Russian doctor working for the City Department of Health that high-intensity x-ray treatment of the scalp successfully treated the disease. So the New York Department of Health arranged to have all school-aged children line up in the halls of the Bellevue Hospital on the east side of Manhattan to take their turn to have their scalp x-rayed. The procedure was quick. First, one side of the scalp was scanned with high-powered x-rays, then the other side was scanned. One child after another for days to months were treated, and the scourge finally went away. It was a total success, so they thought. In the mid-1970s and in my 30s, I noticed some bumps on the back of my scalp under the hairline. The bumps were itchy and f- grew fairly rapidly. A visit with a demonologist, no, dermatologist that must be. <laughs> I think it's a dermatologist. <laughs> Could be a demonologist. <laughs> Confirmed squamous cell carcinoma, skin cancer appearing on a very unusual place of the body under the hair, which is rarely exposed to the sun. Eek. 
I was not alone. At the same time, I learned that many of us develop skin cancer under the hairline along the center line region of the scalp. Apparently, as our heads were x-rayed, the area along the center of the scalp received a double dose of high-intensity x-rays. What caused us to be x-rayed is the same parasite that the lady who frequented the beaches of Puerto Rico suffered a fungal disease commonly called ringworm. I don't believe x-rays are still used to treat it. Not being a member of the medical profession, I will not suggest this prescription of antifungal creams, which Dr. Google suggests. I don't want to be responsible for problems that may develop 20 to 30 years later. Wow, that's some story. Did you know about this, Daniel, this skin cancer? I, you know, when he was describing the treatment, I was just waiting for like what what cancer will develop um, it's amazing how much radiation was used wow. in this country before we appreciated the risk. I mean, my dad tells me stories about he used to get his feet x-rayed when he was getting tried shoes, right? Yeah, Make that's sure right. the shoes fit. They have a little portable x-ray machine and oh my. Um, they called yeah, it think, fluoroscope. Yeah, yeah. So uh, right. it was like a that's continuous right. x-ray. It wasn't just a photo. Um, that's right. So it's sort of amazing. I yeah. just saw this movie about Marie Curie and, you yes, know, yes. They, they thought radium was the cure for everything until everyone started getting cancers from it. Sure. And then they she, had parties where they turned out the lights and they all held up their little vials of radium wow. or plutonium. I guess it was plutonium that she was working with, right? I thought it was radium. I think. Yeah. No, I think it was radium, right? There's actually a great theater show, Radium Girls. I don't mm -hmm. know if people okay. are familiar with that. Okay. And they, people would – you'd often lick the little uh, – uh, oh. Paint brush that you were using to paint the radium yeah. on, on the say, dials, the dials of the uh, yeah. clocks. So, but yeah. I, okay, all right. Yes, yeah. radium. Cool. Um, cool. Christina. Uh. Alex writes, the answer is cutaneous larva migrans, which is caused by the larvae of various nematode parasites of the hookworm family and Silostomatida. I think <laughs> that's how it's pronounced. <laughs> I just Googled the word serpiginous. It's all full of difficult words for me, <laughs> which, I've never, <laughs> which I've never heard before. And the first image result gave the answer. The Wikipedia article mentions that hookworm eggs are shed in an infected dog or other animal feces to the ground and beach sand. I'm happy that Daniel said the lines were migrating because up to that point, that was certain the question was intentionally easy to throw people off the trail. Hmm. This is the first case I've ever guessed. I only started listening to you recently, and this is lots of fun. Hmm. Alex from Israel. Dixon. Yes, sir. Owain writes, Dear Twip, Thanks to Vincent for artfully making sure my email got read on TWIP 194. I laughed out loud when listening to how I nearly failed to make the cut. To make up for that and to ensure that it doesn't happen again, I'm submitting this much more promptly. My guess this time is CLM, or cutaneous larva migraines. The most likely cause is a dog hookworm, Ancelostoma caninum, or Brasiliense. Less likely differentials would be human hookworms or strongyloides, which are making their way to the bloodstream, having percutaneously entered their host. While this submission might not win me a book, my increased speed at sending this in makes me feel like a winner regardless. Still trying for the book, though. All the best, Owain. Daniel. <clears throat> Daniel. All right. Byron writes, Dear Twip hosts, I was listening to Twip while driving my son to his tennis practice, and upon hearing Dr. Griffin's case, I responded, Oh, I know about that one. I actually could not remember the exact kind, but the picture of the foot with serpiginous lesions immediately came to mind. My son then turned his head away from his phone, I might add, and <laughs> looked at me saying, how do you know that? The look on his face, priceless. Uh, this is one of those treats as a parent, right? When the, the face comes away from the phone and they look at us. Well, my guess is this is a nematode infection causing cutaneous larva migraines, LCM, from dog and cat hookworms, and cyclostoma brasiliensa and uncinaria stenocephala. I hope I am right this time. Thank you for everything you do. It is 61F, 16C, and cloudy in Naperville, Illinois. Byron. Naperville, never heard of that. Must be a great place. Oh. Yeah. Antoinette writes, Hello, I am a visual artist from Melbourne, Australia, currently 24 degrees C. Antoinette, 
I want you to note my pronunciation, Melbourne. <laughs> the last time I was there, they taught me how to pronounce it. It was perfect. I haven't actually done any biology since high school, but my curiosity grew over the last year after I found Vincent's virology lectures on YouTube. Now I'm hooked on all things Microbe TV and look forward to all of the This Weekend on the channel. I'm also halfway through Brianne Barker's immunology online lectures. I may be in over my head. Nah, you're okay. My initial guess was scabies, but after a little research based on the clues, Puerto Rico, raised red lines, and dogs on the beach, I think it is cutaneous larva migrants caused by larvae of hookworms. But as I haven't taken a YouTube course on parasites yet, I could be completely wrong. Any re recommendations on online lecture series would be appreciated. Stay safe. Keep up the fabulous work from all the way down under Antoinette and Antoinette on the same YouTube channel. If you go to my YouTube channel, just go down a bit. You got the parasitology course taught by Dixon and Daniel. There you go. Or you can go to parasiteswithoutborders.com. I think the, the videos are linked yes. there as well, right, Daniel? Absolutely. <clears throat> they, they are. And I think it's 40 plus lectures. There's a lecture for every chapter. It's free. Right. And um, it is very exciting and engaging. Yes. So <laughs> highly recommended the best <laughs> the best parasitology he course. He said modestly. <laughs> I think Funny. actually, yeah. if I remember correctly, I may be bow tie free. I may be like dressed in my tropical medicine garb. Yeah. <laughs> yep. The only thing missing was your pith helmet. <laughs> I've got like my tropical shirts that I wear, so. Yeah. That's right. Christina. Peter writes, greetings to the luminaries of the Twipoverse. <clears throat> the woman in Twip 194 who visited the beach in Puerto Rico is probably affected by Ancylostoma brasiliense, the dog or cat hookworm. The serpiginous lesions are a telltale sign. And she gives a reference. He gives a reference. Eosinophilia can also be present as it is in this case and another reference. And while it may also be absent, hookworms are rarely associated with a form of pulmonary eosinophilia called Loeffler syndrome. If I am correct, this is the same affliction as was covered in TWIPS 123 and 150. Researching this disease, I was struck at how, as a typical for medical photographs, the imagery was all of red or brown lesions on pale skin. What does CLM look like on darker skin tones? I include an image from Brazil, and here's another mm. reference. Notice how the lesion is much less visible. And there's a picture, which I presume will be in the show notes, in the letters, and there's another, uh, another image from India. One can see how the lesion appears light and almost shiny. As the issue of racism in medicine is currently getting so much needed attention, I think it is useful to highlight the need to include a diversity of images in the descriptions of disease symptoms. Thank you again for your efforts, Peter from a somewhat chilly 16C Cape Town. Still no COVID-19 vaccines in sight here, although we are told the long-awaited vaccination of elderly and vulnerable groups should start in mid-May. And apparently, 325,260 doses of Pfizer vaccine are arriving in South Africa tonight. Hmm. And there's a reference list below. It's not a lot of doses. <laughs> Not for that many people, no. Dixon. Yes, sir. Trudy writes, dear Twippers, here I am showing up for the easy ones. The lady who returned from Puerto Rico or Puerto Rico had a case of cutaneous larva migraines caused by nematode parasites of the hookworm family. Thanks for the continued entertainment. Best regards, Trudy. Edutainment. Uh, uh, sorry, I missed that. You're you right. know, it's different. It's different. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Dan, Dan, Annie writes, hello, I hope you're all doing well. I'm a first time listener of the Twee series and thought I would give this case study a shot. It sounds like the woman is suffering from cutaneous larva migraines, which occurs when hookworm larvae penetrate the skin. It's not uncommon for this to happen at beaches when people are walking barefoot, especially on beaches where dogs are allowed. The diagnosis is also supported by the elevated eosinophil levels, which are a common feature of helminth infections. Best Annie, a PhD student. Neil writes, 
Greetings from Ireland, where it's five Celsius, wet and windy, 365 days a year. <laughs> However, <laughs> the work you do at TWIP Virtual Studios is the light of our lives, particularly Dixon, who we would love to welcome to Dublin for innumerable pints of Guinness as soon as we're released from this travel ban. Invitation accepted. <laughs> <laughs> In the meantime, thank you to Daniel for another wonderful case. It is, of course, cutaneous larva migrants. This is principally caused by dog and cat hookworms. Of these, I would favor Ancelostoma brasiliensis, in this case, given the mention of dogs in the vignette. The L3 larvae of these nematodes can survive in sandy, moist soil for days and are particularly common on Caribbean and Southeast Asian beaches. The clinical phenomenon described is what is commonly known as the creeping eruption, typically apparent after an incubation period of approximately a week Diagnosis can be confidently made on clinical grounds given the distinctive nature of this presentation. Although as referenced where bloods are taken, they do typically show an eosinophilia or elevated IgE. Treatment consists of anti-helminthic therapy, single-dose ivermectin representing a simple and effective regimen. And, and there's something in Gaelic, which I, I can't pronounce. Can you pronounce that, Christina? No, I'm afraid not. Go ride Maybe mile, mith, a guy, Neil. Daniel's uh, Irish. Come on. Yeah, but you know, Neil, you got to send us a pronunciation guide next time so we can get that, so we can do it justice. True. Christina. Joel and Bronwyn Wright. Good day to a peruse. <laughs> I'm writing from Bundaberg, Australia, home of the eponymous ginger beer. I believe the woman who enjoys long walks on the beach has a case of cutaneous larva migrants, CLM. The pictures that you described show the creeping eruption. While this specific sign was described in Dixon's lectures on hookworms as a manifestation of Ankylostoma caninum, parasitic diseases, the sixth edition, indicates that this particular parasite is more associated with eosinophilic enteritis here in Queensland. A more appropriate guess, considering the geography, would be Ankylostoma brasiliensis, although a variety of hookworms can still present as CLM. Whatever the culprit, a prescription of albendazole is likely adequate first-line treatment, along with preventive measures, either footwear for her sandy strolls or limiting them to bipede-exclusive beaches. Thank you for your podcast, which managed to do to be both educational and entertaining. We always look forward to the next one. Joel and Bronwyn. Dixon. Arthur writes, Dear Twips team, the case presented at the end of episode 194 jarred loose some memories. I believe I have personal experience with the parasite in question. About 40 years ago, I had just relocated from Connecticut to South Florida. I had not yet developed the habit of gardening with gloves. Perhaps it will not surprise you to learn that I developed a very itchy rash on my hands. I had relatively few, few lesions, which seemed to increase in length in a wandering fashion. I was told by the locals that the rash was called creeping eruption and was caused by gardening. My PCP told me that it was cutaneous larva migrans caused by cat or dog hookworms. The larvae lacked the enzyme to break through the derm... Hmm. The larvae lacked the enzyme to break through the dermis and would eventually die. Since I had only a few lesions, the treatment of choice was freezing with liquid nitrogen. This was done by freezing a point just ahead of the advancing line. I later found that with salt and the corner of an ice cube, I could generate cold sufficient to euthanize new larval lesions. I did look up the names of most of the likely actors in this. Ancelostoma caninum and Ancelostoma brasiliensi is the in these more enlightened times the treatment is apparently with thiabendazole or albendazole. I no longer have this issue since I re returned to New England and I garden wearing nitrile gloves under my elbow length leather gauntlets. Hmm. Best wishes to you all, Martha. Hmm. Daniel. The Parasitology Club at the Univers University of Central Lancashire writes, <clears throat> Dear TWIP professors, greetings from the University of Central Lancashire in the northwest of the United Kingdom on this extraordinary sunny day, but cold as the temperature outside is 6 Celsius or 42.8 F as we write to the case 194. It is 
is always awesome to listen to exciting new cases. We all look forward to listening to your amazing podcasts. Lancashire has some amazing history. A small town within Lancashire called Burnley is a historic market town with amazing surrounding countryside called the Pennines et al. Burnley, Lancashire, Discover Britain's Towns 2021. We have provided a link of our university's history starting from 1828. Please find the link at the bottom of our letter. Okay. Uh, the serpiginous eruptions appear to resemble the descriptions of cutaneous larva migraines, migraines, CLM. The culprit is one of the hookworm species and most likely Ancylostoma brasiliensis, which has a wide geographic distribution, but is noted for infections associated with walking barefoot on soil or beaches in Southern and South America and the Caribbean. The rhabditiform larvae of the helminth can penetrate the skin and migrate along the dermal layers of the skin, causing intense itching and redness. Diagnosis is normally clinical in this dermal infection. Shimaguar and colleagues, 2013, reported increasing peripheral eosinophilia correlated with disease severity in CLM and which decreased following treatment with ivermectin. Neil Vickers, all the best. Safe wellness from the Parasitology Club at the University of Central Lancashire. Caton writes, <clears throat> excuse me, greetings all ye of the TWIP persuasion. I suspect the woman who visited the local beaches in Puerto Rico walked through the sand barefoot and got infected with Ancelostoma brasiliense, a hookworm that had been previously deposited by a fellow beach lover's canine companion. Seeing as the woman was about 40 years old, she likely carried in her own beach chair, thus saving her from finding the dreaded cutaneous larva migrants on other unmentionable locations. Reading about hookworm, I discovered a new vocabulary word, pruritic. I had to look it up as I am not a doctor. I am just a lady farmer. This is when I questioned certainty of my amateur diagnosis. I went back to Daniel's telling of the case story on TWIP 194. He states that the woman noticed some slow-moving raised red lines on her feet and took pictures of them as they grew over time. Now, Daniel, didn't she notice that those raised red serpiginous lines were incredibly itchy? Also, I wonder, would the high level of eosinophils contribute to the itchiness of the pruritus? I hope I... I sure hope I am on the correct serpiginous track, Caton. <laughs> and Caton reminds me that her farm, where she raises grass-fed beef, is in Iron River, Michigan, not Missouri. And yes, I made that mistake many times. Thank you for correcting it, Lady Farmer Caton. <laughs> Christina. Ruti writes, and I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, dear TWIP team, my answer for TWIP 193, shall I read that out? Because that was for the last one, or should I just move on to? Sorry, don't read it. Yeah, I am. Um... Okay, I'll just skip on to for TWIP 194. This morning while I was commuting, I was listening to a parasite lecture on hookworm, on Parasite Without Borders. And while returning, I listened to TWIP 194. So my guess is a bit biased. A mid forties lady returning from Puerto Rico was possibly suffering from anthylostoma caninum. Treatment will be thiabendazole ointment. P.S. Today we also received a CSF sample from a patient and I have attached two videos of that sample. We are querying Negleria fowleri, which is a distant cousin of Acanthamoeba. Free living parasite, most infections are associated with untreated water. If Dr. Griffin and Dr. De Pommier can help with the diagnosis, that will be helpful. Thanks for all the education. And that's Dr. Druti Seth, chef, um, first year DNB microbiology student um, in Mumbai. Oh, so I forgot that, that Dr. Sheth had sent, um, let's see. Oh, that's the answer for the other one. Okay. But then he, he or she sent these photos for Daniel and uh, Dixon to try and diagnose. <laughs> we could use a higher magnification of them, unfortunately, because at this magnification, it's hard to tell which one he wants us to look at. Yeah, let me um, 
Yeah, and actually, I should just say to Dr. Drudy Sheth, why don't you just reach out to us and uh, Vincent, if you can get us connected, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Help in in real time here. This is probably something that we want to. I'll, I'll forward the email to you. Yeah. Thank you. Dixon. Caddy uh, Jane writes. Hi all, 71 degrees and humid here in northwest, north central Wisconsin. I got the garden weeded and started planting yesterday. Great to hear Christina and Nalula back on last month's episode. There are plenty of parasites that can be contracted by playing on beaches, such as Toxic Caracanus and human hookworms, Nicator americanus, but these tend to cause symptoms other than itchy feet with sore pigeon as lit trails. My guess for our case study is cutaneous larva migraines caused by the larvae of Ancelostoma brasiliensi, a hookworm carried by dogs and cats. There are also other dog and cat hookworms that can cause this infection, but from a quick Google search, this species is the most likely culprit. Thanks again for another great episode. And she writes us from uh, the North Central Technical College in Warsaw, Warsaw, Wisconsin. Hmm. Daniel. All right. James writes, Dear Twip, I have really enjoyed the show and even got my lab into some of the guessing over the last couple of episodes. We study alpha herpes viruses. As I'm writing this email, sitting on a beach, wondering if I've stepped on a parasite myself. My guess to the case of the 40-year-old woman that frequents Puerto Rico is cutaneous larva migrants um, and celestoma brasiliensis. Keep up the great shows and work. Thanks, James. David writes, dear professors, for the first time in over a year, I finally have caught up with TWIP, that with the virology podcast bringing us tidal waves of scientific backgrounds for SARS-CoV-2. It is so impressive how much each of you manages to do in the midst of a pandemic. Podcast aside, it makes my own achievements look rather small, and all three of you are a constant source of inspiration. When I listened to the last episode, I couldn't help but smiling. Dogs and beaches, it seems a fatal coincidence. My guess is cutaneous larva migrants caused by Ancelostoma brasiliense or as Parasitic Diseases 6th edition puts it, L3 larvae are especially common on beaches in Puerto Rico where dogs and cats are permitted to wander the beaches and freely defecate. Pure poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Hope I'm right and in time with my submission. For your reading pleasure, so David provides a little limerick. After she got her diploma, she loved Puerto Rico's aroma. She went to the beach, the dogs off its leash. Her foot now shows ancelostoma. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Yours truly, David, in an ever sunny Nicaragua. Christina. You got muted. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> it's late. Elise writes, Dear Twip Trifecta and any guests, I do hope this finds you all well. It is sunny and 72 degrees F, 22 degrees C here in Lower Manhattan. I am very sorry to have missed my chance to submit a diagnostic guest for Twip 193. The last few weeks have gotten suddenly busy. I am pleased to say that one of the things that has kept me running around has been the project of getting my family vaccinated. One family member had to be hauled all the way out to Staten Island twice for this because I was so eager to get him vaccinated as soon as possible. My guess for the vacationer in Puerto Rico is that she came back from her holiday with cutaneous larva migrants, taking, her, taking their own vacation to the United States. It is not at all uncommon for animals of various sorts to deposit these hookworm larvae on beaches or in sandboxes. And then exposure through barefoot walking on the hookwormy sands allows for infection. The patient's symptoms are pretty classic for the infection. The CDC says that these infections are usually self-limiting. The migrating larvae usually die within six weeks, but treatment with albendazole or even ivermectin is very effective. Will the patient need to treat her dogs for hookworm now after this vacation? I know that it is generally protocol for veterinarians to recommend always giving dogs medication to guard against heartworm, but does hookworm need to be treated in a different way? Thank you so much, as always, for everything you do and many best wishes. Elise in Lower Manhattan. Uh, Elise, it's, Staten Island is not so far. I mean, all the way out. 
<laughs> you could take the Staten Island ferry and have a lovely trip. Anyway, that was uh, that was actually one of my we'll call it an inexpensive date when I was younger. It used to be that you could go down to the south um, end there of Manhattan and you could get on the ferry and as long as you didn't get off and you could get back off in Manhattan. Yeah. So that was uh, you know, and it's be- it is beautiful, I have to say. Anyone coming to visit New York if you're, you know, people do the other things, but yeah, the ferry to and from Staten Island, that south area of Manhattan, uh, seeing it from the ferry, it's beautiful. So Daniel, do you have to treat the dogs uh, for hookworm? Do you know? Well, let's um, let's go into this because I think this is exciting. We still have, uh, I think, what three more people that want to guess. Okay, Christina, shall we start with you? Put you on the spot. I think if there's no other thing it could be than cutaneous larva migrants. I wouldn't bet my life on which species of hookworm, <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely cutaneous larva migrants. All right, Dixon, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I think I wrote the uh, <laughs> description in the, the <laughs> sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases. So, sure, cutaneous larva migraines. And, and the comment about uh, using pictures of people of color rather than um, uh, Caucasian or white-skinned people, um, I believe in our textbook we do have a picture of a dark-skinned person with the parasite. And I've got the book I think it's a pasty. I think it's a pasty white foot in the current edition. You do, um, but no, that's a good point. And I should actually mention that this right. individual was not a pasty white Caucasian. No, um, so initially, not. when we started talking about Puerto Rico, I was, you know, thinking maybe she was from Puerto Rico. All um, right, right. But so, um, yeah, and and I actually I think that's a point well taken. Um, it is different to see a lot of the skin dermatological findings on different color skin. Um, you know, particularly I'll say fungal, right? Some of the fungal, what you're often seeing on a darker skinned individual is areas of paleness, of lighter mm-hmm. color, as opposed to when a Caucasian, it might be areas of erythema. So um, seeing erythema on dark skin, is it, it actually takes experience to uh, start seeing things in a different um, skin color population. Right. It's a point really well taken. Right. I actually try to address that in our image banks and actually it's surprisingly difficult to find images with all different skin tones that one might encounter around the globe. But I do I do make an effort actually just to show the differences because it can be really different. It's also, it's an interesting thing. I'll say over time, we've become maybe a little more sensitive to requesting photos of people, right? Mm -hmm. So often I'll say, I think we just lost dicks in there. Um, But um, often when I'll be, let's say I'm in Uganda and I see something, you know, on the foot of a child and and that's largely a black population. um, Then, um, you know, you you feel bad. Hey, can I take a picture of your foot? And, you know, because you're, you know, for me, I'm in a role in that point of a clinician. I'm taking care of them. And then I sort of feel like now I'm switching roles. Can Mm. I, um, you know, take a photo, make this educational? And, and, you know, and and sometimes I will, like if it's a small child with pneumonia or something, and we've been talking for a while and there seems to be a rapport. But I think we have an increased sensitivity now. And I think that's positive, um, you know, when we want to ask permission for a photograph to be used for educational purposes. Yep. So now that Dixon is gone, I guess we should. No, Dixon is back. There was a knock <laughs> at my door, and I had to go and answer it. Sorry okay. about that. Vincent, did you want to? Did you want to jump in? Did you have a different idea? No, this is clearly beach, sand, dog, serpiginous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was. I remember that from. I think we had a case like it before, but if not, Dixon certainly has talked about it in his lectures, and I sat there to yep. to record all of them. So. I, you I, soaked it all up, though, Vincent. You you absorbed that like a sponge. Well, so I'm not I, so I sure. But my hats off to you. No, really, you do. You you learned a lot, and you yeah. Retained I mean, a lot this also. is um, <clears throat> this is something I've seen several times, and um, I'm not sure which cases I've shared. There was a case I saw in a woman uh, that went with um, I don't know if it was a fiance, a honeymoon. I'm not sure, but I saw the case in. Um, Peru, and she had gone to Colombia. You know, at hmm. times they blame you know Colombia for a lot of problems that aren't necessarily Colombia's problems. But on the beach there, she had laid out on the sand, hmm. and she had these serpiginous lesions all over her legs. I mean, it was actually yeah. quite extensive. Yeah. 
pretty sad. Um, you know, but no, I, I think I described a case actually one of the first times I was volunteering with Femeric um, down in uh, the Dominican Republic. Um, one of the individuals down there had this going on, didn't know what it was. Um, and some of the times you'll not only just see the serpiginous lesions, but you'll actually see blistering that occurs with it. Um, and I, oh. I tried to I tried to make this a really classic, um, you know, to give you give everyone all the things. Mm. The slow moving, so it's larva curans, um, as a so it's larva migrans as opposed to larva curans. So think about your Latin um, migrating here um, versus running, right? So your strongaloides is going to be running. You're actually going to see it moving pretty rapidly in real time. This, as I mentioned, you have to take almost these time-lapse photos and you can see that over time it's slowly moving, maybe a sonometer or two a day versus yeah. a sonometer, maybe an hour with the strongaloides rash. Okay. Um, yeah. And then the dogs, and this is a big thing. You know, most tourists, when they go to a place like Puerto Rico or the Dominican Republic or these other locales, they'll go to the tourist beaches where the dogs are prohibited. And you may notice that they do this raking of the beach every morning, hmm. you know, and you think, right. oh, that's just to make it look nice. But what they're actually doing <laughs> is they're raking so that the, the, the eggs actually have to go on th under, undergo this embryonation. Um, they don't instantly become infectious. And so by doing that, you can interrupt and, and prevent uh, people from getting it by being on the tourist beaches because people will, I think I was described, they're going to walk around to and from the water. You're not going to wear flip-flops the whole time. So it's sort no. of, um, hmm. you know, you need to have some other measures. Um, so, so yeah, hopefully this had this had all the features. I, I love this story. Actually, it was a very recent case that I, that I saw. So it's sort of nice for me to uh, actually get to see some fresh right. parasite cases. Yeah. So in San Juan um, or in, in Puerto Rico altogether, all the beaches are public. So you're allowed to bring your pets and they can't stop you except for one place, the Hilton Hotel. They built a stone wall around some beach and bought the property <laughs> and there are no dogs allowed. <laughs> so wow. if you want to go to a parasite-free beach in San Juan, at least you have to stay at the Hilton. Anyway, I, I guess we should do a little of the, the basic science here, right? So, and some of our writers brought this up, some of our emailers, um, that, yeah, this is a, it's a hookworm that has um, found itself in, in, so to speak, the wrong host. Right. Um, and the, the current belief is that um, these uh, species lack the right collagenase to allow them to deeper penetrate. So they can't get farther in, which is why this is a dead end cycle um, that, figures into the dog issue. So this individual is not going to allow this hookworm to complete its life cycle. She will not be at risk for her pets when she gets back here to the U.S. So this is a dead end. Right. Um, it is hmm. a clinical diagnosis. You know, we, we rarely, um, hopefully we don't go biopsying and cutting pieces of <laughs> skin. PCR um, the <laughs> debris yeah. and all that. No, you won't do yeah, that. Yeah, no, we just, <laughs> we look at it. It's recognized by someone who's experienced the diagnosis yeah. is yeah. made. Um, and the treatment, the treatment's actually evolved. Um, I have to say early on, people used to actually do a lot of liquid nitrogen freezing. Um, and if you do that, if you mm -hmm. spray these areas with liquid nitrogen, you're going to get all this blistering if you didn't get it to begin with. Um, so right. we, uh, we, we currently frown on that approach. I'll say that gently. Yeah. Um, you, a single treatment of ivermectin is curative. Single treatment, yes. ivermectin. Yes kills them, um, the body mops it up, and that's the end of it. Um, you can actually use, you know, other thiabendazoles, right? You can use a topical thiabendazole. Um, you can use an oral albendazole. Um, but in the U.S., that's actually going to be much more expensive than just, you know, take these four or five pills. It's a weight-based ivermectin single-dose approach. Huh. Would you ever so see this, this in the, the Northeast, Daniel? Um you know, it, it, probably rarely. It's it's not very common. I'm trying to think of circumstances where you might, but no. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't. I don't think I've ever seen a local case. Uh, Dixon, have you ever seen a local case? I have not, but I uh, I was a student of Harold W. Brown, who grew up in uh, Kentucky and other places south, and uh, he was absolutely fond of talking about plumber's itch, <laughs> and plumber's itch. <laughs> Is the this, this the same uh, manifestation? Um, the houses in the south are uh, many of them were built um, on platforms or cinder blocks to allow the cooling effect of, of the breezes to 
cool from the bottom of the house up to the top. But it was also a great place for the dogs to go because it was also very cool. And they used to do everything down there and, you know, eat, sleep, you know, have other dogs, that sort of thing. And they would defecate, of course. So uh, Harold Brown uh, described this as the, the plumber was hot. He would take his shirt off. There weren't any she plumbers apparently down there at that time of the year uh, or ever perhaps. And they would grab a hold of the porch and then slide underneath the porch to reach the plumbing. Mm. And they could slide very easily because the whole bottom of the ground was covered with dog feces. And their backs would look like a Ren and McNally roadmap. When they when they got all of these lesions, they they had horrible, horrible invasions of thousands of larvae penetrating their skin in some cases. And in those days, there were no good drugs for this. So they would, I guess, um, those people must have gone through hell before those larvae died because there's a very intense etching that occurs with this. Yes, yeah. And that, that was something that um, I think one of our emailers wrote in about. These are really itchy. It's really yeah. itchy. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And I was going to, I wanted to correct a little bit. We had one of the writers who was yeah, talking yeah, yeah, about right, um, right. Dubini, right? When you're talking about the Goddard tunnel. So the, yeah. in that case, those were, um, those were human um, hookworms. Yes. So, yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, and I think that's sort of a critical. So the, the human hookworm, um, you know, and Cyclostoma duodenale or Americanus, these are these right. are actually going to be able to undergo the full life cycle. So what was happening there is, you know, you're in that tunnel. So the people had hookworm, they were defecating. It was sort of the whole cycle was going on there. Exactly. Uh, and so, they were and actually here, really unwell and ill. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, the, the reason why they were defecating in the tunnel was not because Italians are particularly unsanitary, and I know they're not, but <laughs> as you drill into this tunnel and you get a mile or so into the tunnel, imagine, oh, I'll be right back. I have got to go to the bathroom. And you walk a mile out of the tunnel. You walk back. It's time for lunch. And then the next time you do it, it's time for dinner. Um, so by the time the tunnel got to be more than a mile long mm -hmm. and the workers were all at the base of that tunnel – they just started defecating in the tunnel. And that's when this all happened. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to the Strongyloides story we see in areas of our country where we have mines, right? You yeah, that's exactly right. All exactly the way, right. you know, do prepare ahead of time. <laughs> what is, Daniel, what are your thoughts of Joe from New York with the fungus? <laughs> yeah, actually, so that's Oof. a good point. Is people call this ringworm, and it's probably a good opportunity for us to point out that it is not a parasitic infection ringworm. There is a serpiginous red border, you know, and it's so this this ring, and this is not this is a fungus, um, a and it's actually right. yeah, it's a dermatophyte, so it's a fungus that lives on the skin, um, tinea, you know. So you're gonna put a topical antifungal on that, not radiation, please. Um, oh. And yeah, this is <laughs> so, and that is. That is a super common uh, malady. We see it. We see it all the time. It's actually quite common. Um, when I travel to the tropics, I'll usually bring a tube of topical antifungal with me. Um, not even so much for the people that I'm going to take care of, but fellow travelers. Um, it is is quite common for people to get these fungal infections and just a topical antifungal. Um, and again, that's not a uh, that's not a parasitic infection. No, no. It's not a eukaryote. Well, it is a eukaryote. Of course, it is. Yes. It actually, is. Yeah, we. we yeah, we neglect the fungi, don't we? We do. When I was a kid, <laughs> and that was a while back, um, growing up in California, I developed a case of impetigo, which is, I believe, a streptococcal infection. You, usually, sometimes staph as well, but usually. Okay. Yeah. And the doctor who treated me, because you get these skin lesions, right? He treated me with ultraviolet light. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think I was lucky not to develop skin cancer of some sort because uh, I went for like a week and a half or something like this every day after school. And I do remember it distinctly because uh, it was kind of interesting to look into the UV light. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You have to go blind. You know, little kids, so <laughs> what are you going to tell them? You tell them don't do it. And, uh, of course, they do it. Yeah. Daniel, one more. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Where the uh, Elise wants to know if you treat the dogs uh, – yeah, so that would be the issue. So, um, you know, our our mystery woman here, she doesn't need to worry about her dogs back here. Now, the dogs in places like this, um, the standard worm medicine, I don't know if, if our listeners have worms or, or my 
fellow twiffers have worms, have dogs. Um, but you're supposed to once a month give them this worming concoction, right? Um, and that would actually eradicate this in those dogs. So, you know, there's mm-hmm. usually an ivermectin in there and some other, um, it's usually a, a three um, component um, in these in these different worm pills. Um, but yeah, that would be, but these dogs in Puerto Rico are not getting, not getting their monthly worming medicine. All right. I think it's time to give away a book Indeed. in theory, because <laughs> I have a backlog of books because we have to get them autographed and uh, maybe someday uh, we'll be able to get together again. We'll be a family once again. <laughs> I think soon, actually, right? We're, we're getting our space there just by Penn Station. So we're all going to come in. Everyone's vaccinated. So oh, this will be good. We'll just sign our books. That means That's I right. have to bring them from my office down. There. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Aye, aye, aye. I got about 12 of them, you know. Anyway, we'll do it. It's no problem. I'll take them one we'll, at a time. We'll, we'll all pool together. We'll like splurge for like what, a taxi? And you can throw them all in the trunk. Or Dixon, go. Dixon will drive in in his Prius, and we could fill that with books. I could do that. I could do that. That wouldn't be wrong. Would <laughs> not right. be wrong. All right, we had twenty guesses, oh, so nice. let's pick a random number between one and twenty. <laughs> wow, look at that! It turned out to be twenty. <laughs> well, I think David in Nicaragua didn't you win a book? Uh, <laughs> I don't remember, but if you did, let us know. And I will next time we will pick it for someone else. All right. I have a feeling David did win a book. Anyway, David, send your response to twip at micro dot TV. Uh, I just I should keep a record, but I don't. We have a, we have a, an interesting paper that uh, I found this time. How about that? Oh, this was your find. This is a great paper. It's a very nice paper. It is um, – well, let me, let me pull it up here. Hang on, folks, because apparently I closed it before when I was uh, doing the other paper. But uh, yeah, it, was, this- uh, be- it was behind a paywall, right? I had to actually pull it out and distribute it. I think it's open access. Yeah, it's open. It- yeah, I okay. think it, it, it says open next to – the title. So it, yep. Oh, it does. That, it does. That, Look, that's such a giveaway. Open <laughs> <laughs> it is in Nature, Nature Partner Journals slash Vaccines, an epitope-based malaria vaccine targeting the junctional region of circumsporozoite protein by Yelenkova, Jun, Eaton, Petrovsky, Zavala, and Chakarian, and these individuals at the University of New Mexico. School of Medicine, John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, uh, a uh, a company in Australia, Vaccine, and it's spelled V-A-X-I-N-E. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, and Flinders University in Australia. Uh, this is about a, a very cool vaccine against malaria, which pla- Plasmodium falciparum, which combines malaria antigens with viruses. How cool is that? Right? Now, I would like either Dixon or Daniel to explain to us, um, there, there are apparently a number of different malaria vaccines that target different stages, but this one is pre-erythrocytic stage, which they say would be sterilizing. Yes. Can you explain that to us? Sure. Uh, I'll take the easy one. Okay, Daniel? <laughs> yeah, I, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Who gets the easy one? Um, you, you, go, yeah, uh, you, can, you can do the molecular biology. I'm going to do the bi- biology. Okay. <laughs> okay. So when the mosquito, female Anopheline mosquito bites and injects her um, anticoagulants and uh, hemodilating substances to obtain a blood meal, she, if she's infected with malaria parasites, she injects the sporozoite stage. The sporozoite stage is a uh, haploid organism which travels passively through the blood until it reaches the liver, at which point there's a receptor for for the uh, sinusoidal cells of the hepatocytes, and it actually attaches. And that, that's the first event in the invasion stage. It then goes through that layer into the uh, sinusoids of the liver itself and then penetrates into a um, a uh, parenchymal cell of the liver and initiates the infection. Um, so if you can prevent that, 
You know, if you use any other stage of this parasite besides that one, you're looking at an infection as it matures in the blood of the patient, basically. Because what happens after the sporozoite um, enters the hepatocyte, it then undergoes a uh, transformation into something called a cryptozoite stage, which is a rounded up stage of the parasite. And then it divides like crazy. And you get hundreds to perhaps even thousands of these cryptozoites. And they're called cryptozoites because they're not in the blood yet. They're still in the, the liver cells. But at one point, as with virus infections also, when the viruses reach a certain level, sometimes the cells lice open, releasing their contents. And in this case, when that happens, the, uh, the now merozoites they transform from the cryptozoite to the merozoite stage instantly as they're entering the blood of the patient. And from that point on, the parasite is a blood stage parasite. And it starts to infect other red cells and then destroying red cells and then eventually the anemia. Eventually, of course, you get sick. If you can prevent all of that from happening by starting with the stage that initiates the infection, you can prevent all the pathology from the infection. But it's, it's really unusual to find a vaccine that does that because of the thousands of sporozoites that are injected. All you need is one. Mm -hmm. And then when that one avoids the vaccine, the infection proceeds as though there was no vaccine. So and I think the process is really quite quick, isn't it? It's just like yes, minutes to about it is, an hour it is, it is, it the is. liver cells. That's so exactly it's a very right. short window of opportunity, that's correct. really. So this, this is a remarkable vaccine for many reasons, and that's just one of them. And the other Actually, one is that, it, I'm sorry. sorry, I was just going to comment on the circumsporozoite mm -hmm. protein, yeah. uh, which is a repeated um, epitope identified first at the New York University, Daniel, where you got your MD degree by uh, Victor and uh, Ruth Nussenswag. And uh, they um, rode that finding for a long time, trying to make a vaccine against that protein. And they thought they had come up with the ultimate vaccine against malaria, but unfortunately they haven't. The circumsporozoite protein is not protective enough to induce sterile immunity. And like I said, all you need is one sporozoite to get through that barrier and you've got a full-blown infection eventually. So this vaccine, take it, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I mean, I, 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 I was, as you were telling the story, I was remembering a, a heated, a heated, a passionate discussion that we had on a prior TWIP uh, <laughs> where we were talking about how the, um, how the malaria, how the mosquitoes actually have the ability to, you know, often target a blood vessel. They actually have a heat oh, ability. Yeah. So, and, right. and yeah, as Christina brings up, this is very short. This is minutes to less than an hour. This all happens very quick. So Correct. think about think about the idea of trying to target this. You actually have to have the ability, um, probably anybody based at high levels, to prevent this from getting to the liver. Once it gets to the right. liver, it's right. too late. And That's the right. history of vaccines, right? One of the first um, vaccines that showed any efficacy was, you know, growing up sporozoites. And I think they irradiated them and then injected them, right? This That's was down correct. in, uh, yeah, this was down, I think in Bethesda, down at the NIH, they did that. And uh, so, so this is sort of building on that. Um, you know, most of the time when we target uh, malaria as far as treatment, we're, we're after the fact, right? We're treating this um, past the hepatic, so the erythrocytic stages. Right. Um, the only time, right, that you don't have sporozoites is when someone gets a transfusion-associated malaria. That's always one of our yeah, tricks yeah. on our, our board questions, right? right the person, right. and we see this occasionally, someone has malaria, they donate blood, it's not screened properly, and someone gets malaria from the transfusion. That's the only time when there is not a sporozoite stage that would trigger exactly, this. Exactly, exactly. So, I, and I, like and to... I should, yeah. You can. No, go ahead. No, no, please finish. I was going to say, and I think our <laughs> listeners probably need to remember that as much as we talk about all these different parasites, malaria is in, in many ways sort of the, the emperor of all parasitic diseases. Here, here. Um, you know, hundreds of millions of infections every year, um, you know, with dramatic efforts, we had gotten the death toll down to about half a million per year. Um, right, right. 
unfortunately, as we know with, um, with the pandemic, a lot of these malaria control efforts have gone south, so to speak. And exactly. so we're a little bit, uh, a lot of people say we've probably lost a decade in malaria control. So the idea of having a malaria vaccine um, is huge. Absolutely. I, I'd just like to um, set the history record straight a little bit with regards to the original discovery of why the sporozoite stage could actually induce protection. And that was actually done by a colleague of the nuisance flags who was at NYU. His name was Jerry Vanderberg. And I knew Jerry very well because we were uh, friends and I used to go down there to give lectures. And I think you remember one of my lectures, Daniel, because you were one of my students. And, uh, and after that, I would go over and visit with the parasite group. And so Jerry and I would talk and he would always remember, yes, but I was the first one that, you know, because nobody <laughs> forgets that no matter whether they're given credit or not. Yeah. So Jerry actually thought about irradiating spores whites first. He did, injected them into mice. They were using Prasmodium burgii as the model for human malaria. And he got 100% protection. Actually, on that note, um, Daniel, you mentioned that, you know, relating to the past, but I read in a review just now, I think it was published in 2018, that there's studies ongoing in Mali and adults, um, and that shows that sterile protection with irradiated and um, cryopreserved sporozoites. Is and that Sanofi's results? I, I'm not sure, actually. Um, it, the references like, uh, list another paper. Um, and there's also studies ongoing in Kenya in infants um, using sporozoites. Yes. So, I'm, I mean, it, the protection is really astonishing. That Steve you can Hoffman. Get, but obviously, because That's you right. can't grow these things in culture, um, it's probably yeah, it's very difficult to get new big numbers or, you know, sufficient numbers exactly. to vaccine a exactly. large number of people. So that, you'd have to get um, that out of the mosquito. You'd have to dissect the salivary glands of the mosquito. That's what they're doing. Um, yeah. So I, I don't really know if that, that probably, there's computers probably or robots who can do that now. But no, they, they're still, still done by hand. Still a lot of work. So. It's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> probably not a very practical vaccine, particularly for limited resource settings. No, but, this, yeah. this may replace that. In fact, it was from people immunized with that um, Whole, whole sporozoi vaccine that they identified monoclonals that bind mm. to a different region of the circumsporozoite protein. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. that's right, that's right. Uh, the that's the right. vaccine you talked about, which didn't work so well, was uh, um, was what is it, the N-terminal protein. But yeah, these, exactly. These monoclonals exactly. are the junctional region, which is in the title of the paper. So they decided to take a peptide from that region and see if they can induce uh, protective antibodies. And that's the basis for this paper, which is... Quite cool. And they use a virus, a bacterial virus, Q-beta, bacteriophage Q-beta, which I know very well. It's an RNA virus. And uh, you, we used to have people at Columbia working on that. Did you know Don Mills, Dixon? No, you're muted. Oh, I, no, I did not. But why did they use that virus rather than, say, an adenovirus or something like that? Well, um, <laughs> this one... Uh, you can you can link peptides to the capsid, and ah. this this is an icosahedral capsid, so you can have the the epitope repeated. I think it's ah, thirty two times it's I repeated see, on this I capsid, see, see, so you can have a multivalent uh, antigen which will improve oh, the that's antigenicity. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, I think it's up to three hundred and sixty peptides to each phage that they calculated. Lord. So quite a lot. Yeah, three hundred sixty. That's right. Or do you program their own RNA to produce this as well? You make a fusion with the uh, with the with the capsid. Um, I see. You cross link see. actually I the see. peptides to the pre made capsids. These are virus like particles, gotcha. so they're empty, right? There's no there's oh, okay. no Q beta okay. RNA in them. You could make them, and then you cross link oh, that, the, okay. Okay. the peptides to it. And okay. uh, they have a picture of one of them here, which uh, you can see the repeated peptide over and over again. It's just a short mm -hmm. peptide and. It's linked yes. to the particle, and damn, that induces really good <laughs> antibodies in mice. How about that? And um, it lasts a long, long, long time. They they check these mice out for two years, <laughs> and wow. they still have. That, isn't that how long a mouse lives? <laughs> it's about it. Yeah, but that's a long time to to wait for your experiment. They had a lot of patience. 
Um, and um, th they um, they show that this protects um, mice. The Bergai model, as you say, Dixon, they have an infection model, and they put a luciferase reporter into the P. Bergai so they can easily measure uh, luciferase as a surrogate for infection, right? And uh, immunizing mice, 64% uh, reduction in liver stage parasite burden contained, compared to naive mice. And they can make it even better by adding adjuvants to the virus-like particles, right? They try oh. a couple of different adjuvants. They get even better uh, antibody concentrations. It, it increases the longevity as well. Uh, and uh, it, it protects the mice even better, 90% <laughs> reduction in parasite load uh, with one of these adjuvants. So that's quite nice. Um, then they, they do a non-human primate experiment where I guess you can't really challenge them, right? Because they immunize them and then they take their antibodies and see if they protect mice. So I'm assuming there's not a challenge model in the non-human primates. Do you guys know that? Well, P. bergii is only a mouse parasite, right? Well, they it won't they, infect they, primates. They, they have the falciparum. Uh, oh, that's different. Thing. That's different. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's also I think as we've talked about it, it's really expensive and sort of and then we'll say ethical challenges moving into uh, testing in primates. So, right. But anyway, the, the antibodies that the non-human primates make will protect mice. Uh, so I, I guess next step is to do a phase one in people, Daniel, you think? Um, maybe actually. I mean, so the interesting thing sort of that I took away at this point, right? So we're, we're focusing purely on antibodies, which I tried to sort of preempt, mm. make sense, right? Yeah. Because this is such a short lived stage, the sporozoite stage, you're going to have to have actually a measurable level yeah. of the antibodies to really make a difference. So that, that's good. Um, and so, yeah, you can, you can, at this point, if, um, you know, if the FDA has a little bit of free time to listen to you, um, <laughs> <laughs> right. They, they are swamped to be completely completely honest. Um, but no, to, you know, a small, you know, a normal phase one trial where you give it to a certain number of people, make sure they're okay, make sure they develop antibodies. Um, yeah. I mean, this, this is, um, this is such a pressing issue. I know we're all focused on COVID at the moment, but um, you know, the, the, the burden of malaria, the number of people that have died and will continue to die, you know, every day from malaria, this is really um, critical. They actually even mentioned that some of the other monoclonal antibodies of the three original ones, the, so the one that is discussed in the paper, I think is CYS43, but they mentioned another one, an L9, that apparently is even inducing even stronger antibody response, I think. So maybe, you know, they suggest that maybe we can combine these epitopes mm. All uh, right. to potentially... Um, achieve an even even better protection. Yeah, because it wasn't 100%. It wasn't sterilizing, no. yeah. No, it wasn't no. sterilizing. Yep. Yeah. And they do talk that they would like to see a T-cell response also. Yeah. Yep, yep. Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, so that's pretty good. I like that. And the, yeah, the, it's really interesting. The, uh, these um, viral particles that are multivalent are quite nice. Uh, they, they do, we've looked at some of these recently on TWIV for other applications, and they really um, there's a there was one in uh, for for SARS-CoV-2 where they put a um, one of the viral proteins on a, on a on a nanoparticle, and you get many copies of the protein, and you get a really good immune response when you have the the uh, epitope repeated many times. So very cool. I just wanted to point out a really interesting review on uh, malaria vaccines. It's called, um, it's pre it's been published in the annual review of microbiology and it's a promise of a malaria vaccine, are we closer? And I think it was published in 2018. And actually in that, that review discusses quite well the mm. different approaches that can be taken. So the, the pre erythrocyte you know, the lip the initial stages of infection, <laughs> <laughs> stumbling over those long words now. But then also, um, you know, there's um, vaccines under development mm. for blood stage um, infection, so which could maybe reduce clinical disease. But there's all, they're also discussing actually transmission blocking vaccines, 
which would yes. limit the transmission. Obviously, it wouldn't That's you know right. they, they call it an altruistic vaccine because it wouldn't yep. really give a a benefit to to the to the person who's being vaccinated, but mm. it would prevent on onwards transmission. So this is a really interesting review that kind of you know lists all these. Um, different types of vaccines and what's Absolutely. in trial. So maybe Absolutely. I can... Yeah, put them in. Put it in the show this. notes. I could yeah. put the link in the show notes. I think I can edit those, can't I? You can, yes. We, we, yeah, you so got, I will do that. You have special mm. permission to edit them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I will add that because I thought that was really, really interesting yeah. um, just to get a bit of an overview. Great. Hey, Dixon, you have a hero for us? I do. I do. I do. Um, this is a living hero. This is not a... Uh, a hero of the past. This is a, a hero of the present. Her name is uh, Maria Mota. She's a Portuguese. And I'll just read what I copied out of her bio because I think uh, she's a remarkable person in many ways. Is probably the most well-known female researcher in her home country, Portugal. That includes all researchers, all female researchers that do work on, well, everything except what she does. And speaking of malaria, that's what she works on. She was awarded the Primo Pessoa in 2013, an award that formally recognizes Portuguese individuals who have made eminent and innovative contributions to science, art, or literature. And that covers an enormous swath of uh, disciplines. She was the sixth woman to be given this yearly award since its establishment in 1987. Maria is the executive director of the Instituto de Medicina Molecular in Lisbon, Portugal, and the leader of the research group on the biology and physiology of malaria. Maria has published high-profile malaria research over the past 10 years and attributes her success to her addiction to the pleasure of discovery. Isn't that wonderful? Hmm. In this like piece, that. Maria encourages young scientists to have fun and enjoy their research and not to fear taking no for an answer. She also urges society in general to empower women. She got her uh, PhD in uh, Portugal and then uh, moved to the United States and did her postdoc with uh, a person that we've just mentioned, Victor Nissenzweig. In 2002, she set up her first laboratory uh, at the, um, uh, this is another institute in Portugal. In 2005, she was made a professor at the University of Lisbon. She's been executive director of the Institute ever since. In 19, uh, 2016, uh, Moda was elected a member of EMBO. <clears throat> she is a visiting professor of immunology and infectious diseases at Harvard, the T.H. Can School of Public Health, and the lab of Diane Wirth. And in addition to her career as a researcher, Dr. Moda was founder and vice president of the Portuguese Science Public Outreach Organization Association for uh, Life Sciences. So she's a good example of somebody who deserves recognition at an international level who's probably, at least for as far as I know, not been recognized on uh, our podcast, uh, TWIP, and perhaps uh, as a result, her fame will spread even further. So she gets my uh, nod for hero of the Podcast number 195. <laughs> now, Dixon, do you speak Portuguese? I noticed you on the fly translated Viver a Ciencia into life sciences. That's pretty easy to do, <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> yeah. That one was a no-brainer. <laughs> no, I don't read Portuguese, but I love their music. I just love Brazilian music, so I... I'm a big fan of listening to Brazilian music, and I don't think I've I don't think I've picked up a one word of uh, Portuguese in the meantime, though. I just love listening to the language. It's romantic. It's very romantic. All right, our last segment here on TWIP is a new case study. What do you got for us, Daniel? You know, I had several cases that I was sort of tossing over which one which one to put out here. Um, but, you know, I'm going to continue with, um, I again, maybe this is not fair, but I feel like this is one our listeners should all get. Um, so this is, this, is a, uh, this is a gentleman in his, um, in his 60s um, who uh, does not have a permanent home. So he lives, uh, he's homeless, uh, transient. Um, and he he comes in because he has uh, some skin issues that he would like to be examined, right? Um, so we're going to use that word pruritus. So he is reporting pruritus that he's itchy and really itchy all over, um, you know. And, and in 
dermatology things, you know, a, a picture's worth a thousand words. So we, we want to get right to, uh, right to seeing what, what rash might be appearing here. So he's got a, he's got a heavy coat. It's really not even that cold out, but he's got a really heavy coat on. Um, and then he has um, really an old unwashed uh, polyester uh, collared shirt. And so we have him take that jacket, set it on a chair, takes the shirt off, um, and we examine his body. And he has um, these, um, I'm going to say about a sonometer in diameter patches. Um, they're erythematous, so they're a little bit reddish. Um, and it's on a base, his, his skin itself um, is, is sort of darker all throughout. Um, there are areas where these um, are I say excoriated. They look like he's been scratching them. So there are some areas that are open um, and he has these over, you know, it's in the neck area um, over much of the torso. Uh, okay. And uh, so we, we search very closely. We look at the whole body um, and then we are able to solve the case by stepping away from the man and examining his clothes. <laughs> Okay. With gloves on, I might add. <clears throat> Was that a nudge, nudge, wink, wink I just saw? <laughs> <laughs> so, Daniel, this man uh, sleeps on the street typically? Where is it? In New this, York City? Yeah, or this, where? Man, this man sleeps on the streets. Um, he does not have a home. Um, he does not seek much in the way of medical care. Um, he does have some psychiatric issues. There's a little bit of a challenge getting much more of a history from him. Um, I have the sense, talking to him, that this has been going on for quite a long time. And it was just at this point that he came in for care. Does he have any um, other infectious diseases that we know of? Um, so none that we know of, uh, <clears throat> but he certainly is at risk of other ones. But at this point, we have no blood work um, we don't, we don't know what other infectious diseases he might have. Does he have any drug addictions? Um, he does smell of alcohol, and uh, he does report that he has um, alcohol ingestion on a regular basis. Hmm. Hmm. Does he have any pets? Um, he does not, um, you know, and that, that's an interesting question. A lot of people that live that's, on the streets actually might have a dog, might have a pet. This, this gentleman um, does not. Um, and I will just give people, this is in the New York tri-state area where this, uh, where I saw this gentleman. And, yeah, uh, not an exotic uh, yeah. and you immigrant. Saw, <laughs> what, what season was it when you saw him? Um, so it was actually um, getting into the spring. Now, when he, when he so sleeps. It was actually a little bit warmer, but he still had, you know, a lot of heavy clothes on. And, when he sleeps, does he sleep in a shelter with a lot of other people or does he sleep on the street typically? No, and, and I think this is sort of one of those upsetting things in New York, right? A lot of um, individuals do not want to sleep in the shelters. They can be actually a dangerous place for these individuals. So a lot of them will um, will sleep on, on the streets, cardboard boxes. Um, they'll often have a uh, shopping cart full of belongings and things that they might wrap around themselves at night. Yeah, and when, I, when I drive in, and I come off the GW Bridge, they, there are men sleeping underneath the overpasses there yes, on pieces yes, of cardboard. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Nope. I think I've got all the information I need. All right. Yep. Okay. At least I think I do. Well, I think I do. I don't want to be, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> might be wrong. At, uh, wrong, yes. at Columbia, we are very familiar with homeless because we have a shelter right across the street from our building, as Daniel yes. knows, in the in the That's armory, right. and many That's people right. sleep there. And then in the morning, they all come out and leave. And at any time of day, you can walk by, and there are uh, men hanging around outside. Uh, and they, um, it's really unfortunate that they have to yes. live there. That's no, no question about it. York, cities are not kind to no. the homeless, as we know. No. All right, that'll do it for TWIP195. The show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIP. Over on TWIV last week, someone asked, someone wrote in, said, where do I get these show notes? Can, are they for anyone or are they just for you? <laughs> show me your notes. <laughs> uh, microbe.tv slash TWIP. You can send your case guesses or comments, questions, TWIP at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, if you really like what we do, 
it would make you feel good to support us, I think. That's what I've heard, um, that people who enjoy what others do often get pleasure in supporting them. So go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. There are a number of ways you could uh, do that and show your, your pleasure. And Indeed. Parasites Without Borders, um, we're doing our FEMRIC fundraiser. So if you go there, it's tax-deductible donation, and we're going to double it to contribute up to $40,000 to FEMRIC. Oh, that's great. Parasiteswithoutborders.com. In fact, that is where you can find Daniel Griffin, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Sometimes you can find him at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you, as always. Dixon de Palmier is at trichinella.org and they're livingriver.org. Thank yep. you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. How is the river? Is it living? Some are and some ain't. It depends <laughs> on where you live. <laughs> there was a river in Cleveland once that actually caught on fire. It was called the Vermilion River. Wow. And um, so that's when the age of pollution ruled the United States back in the 50s and early 60s. But we don't have that anymore. Dixon, did Most you know? Uh, did you know that a river runs through it? It used to. <laughs> they put a dam over it now, and it doesn't do that anymore. No, actually, they took it off that river. They took a dam off of that river hmm. that, that they used to make the movie with. They had to film it somewhere else because the river itself had been dammed up. All right. So that, that's been removed, and it's back to its normal self. Christina Nuaula is at the University of Glasgow. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Music on TWIP is by Ronald Jenkies. We'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP it is para. Para. Sinic. Sinic. <laughs> <laughs>